and we're going to start off in verse 4. Last week, how many of you know I had trouble saying that the flies were in the ointment? And um, my family made so much fun of me this week. What happened, Dad? You couldn't say those words. But um, there was a lot involved in that. It was like a tongue twister, wasn't it? So we're going to continue along uh, with Ecclesiastes chapter 10, and we're going to start off in verse 4. I do want to remind people on Facebook, too. I, I'm, I, sometimes I forget to do this. We are taking communion today, and we thank you for joining us. So if you will, um, you know, some people think you just got to have you know, grape juice and crackers or whatever, whatever you got at your house, pull it out and take communion with us. Yeah. It's, it's the act that works, okay, and, and is symbolic of the price that was paid. So I do want to ask you to join us. We, sometimes we, we um, Pam and I, one time we did communion and we didn't have any of the wafers. We decided to use saltine crackers that we had at home. What we didn't do is we didn't look at the expiration date on the saltine crackers. And um, so we just, you know, broke them up and had them ready to go. And afterwards, we had a few people in church that come up and said, hey, communion was great today, but those crackers were rancid. And uh, I had to go look what that word was up. I didn't even know what rancid was. And then when I, then I, I looked it up and I told Pam, you know, they were kind of rancid. They they were so but God honored you know our our obedience and and remembering so we just want to challenge you to do that if you're joining us uh, via Facebook and and live stream so let's get into the word you know we've, we've been talking about lost and found and somebody asked me if the pastor that I had called and got in touch with it ever or texted and got in touch with ever texted me back and I have not heard from him how many of you know just because you don't hear doesn't mean you quit praying so we continue to do our part, <coughs> you know, and, and um, the important thing to remember is there's things in life that love to get you stuck. They love to get you trapped. They love to put you in a lost and found box so that you're just laying there not accomplishing anything. And what, I, what I'm doing with this series, guys, is I'm trying to give you information to, um, to handle your life correctly so that you don't end up in a lost and found box. You know, I've, I've been by some of these lost and found boxes, and it's amazing how um, sometimes you can, you, people go through them and they just take the pieces out that they don't want and just lay them to the side. Well, I don't want that to be a part of people's lives. How many of you know everybody's valuable? And, uh, you know, and, and we do want to um, give everybody the opportunity seriously to, um, to, to handle their life properly. So I ended on this verse of Scripture and it's in Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 4 where it says, If the spirit of the ruler rises against you, don't leave your post. Do not leave your post. For conciliation pacifies great offenses. And I can take this and relate it to a lot of different things. Let me do it this way first. How many of you know that with the elections coming up, you hear a lot of people saying, Well, I'm, I'm just so sick and tired of politics. Anybody in here sick and tired of politics? Be honest. I mean, I think, I think we all could say that. Well, the, the thing with that is, is you, you can't let being sick and tired of politics stop you from doing what you're supposed to do. Okay, and, you know, and I've made comments before, and I'll talk about me instead of talking about you, but in talking about me, I'm talking about you. Does everybody understand that? So, you know, I made, I made some comments, you know, I'm not voting again, I'm not doing, I'm not doing, and God really had to correct me on these things because we see this playing out in this verse of Scripture that if the spirit of a ruler rises up against you, and I'll, I'll explain this a little bit more in detail, it says don't leave your post because disconnecting sometimes is the worst thing that you can do. Connecting is important. Staying connected is important. Can I get an amen on that? So you, you can't let life throw you curveballs to the point to where you stop swinging the bat. You're called to stay in the game. Come on, y'all. You're anointed to stay in the game. You're anointed to be able to handle the things that come your way. And, and sometimes we, let, we get, let little things, you know, I talked about the little foxes that can come in and spoil the vine. We let little things disconnect us. And when we do that, um, you know, we take the ability sometimes away from God to be able to minister anything into that situation. Because here, when it talks about um, conciliation, that means health and sound mind. This is what it's saying. If you leave your post, then you give up a sound mind and health. For conciliation, health and a sound mind pacifies, which is settles down great offenses. 
So when I, when I give God the ability, this is, this is why you can have bad things happen in your life. How many of you have had them? You can have bad things happen in your life. Your job is to stay with God, Amen. regardless of what happens. I've told you, if you're going to fall, fall in God's lap where the mercy pillows are. You know, don't, don't fall out of fellowship. Don't fall away from God. Don't run and go away from God and, and all this. But, um, but this is what the definition of conciliation is. It says, is a disputed resolution process whereby the parties to a dispute rely on a neutral third party known as a conciliator. So this is what ends up happening. When we stay and we keep God, if we, no matter what's going on in the situation, if I stay connected to God, then I enable the Holy Spirit to come in and start working on my behalf. Here, here's what my problem is sometimes, guys. The easiest thing to do sometimes is not stay connected to God because of feelings, because of emotions, because of all kinds of things happening. Um, you know, our responsibility is to stay connected to God. Let me show you how this works because what if, you know, I was talking to someone not too long ago, and y'all know I'm, I'm just saying this to say it, right? It's, if I was Jesus, y'all wouldn't be here right now. Because don't you know the Bible even says, come on, y'all, the Bible even says, he could have called 10,000 angels and said, I don't want to do it, God. He made a choice to do it. And, and when we understand that, then we know that God made a choice to reconcile us to himself, to give us the ability to be reconciled to him and instead of keeping us as foreigners, he made us family. All right, and part of that is, is I have a connection to heaven. I have a connection to God. Give me an amen on that, y'all. But not only do I have that, how many of you know, uh, sometimes I, that is all I have that I can rely on. You know, because there's been situations in my life to where I, I've just had to go to God and say, God, you know, I, I don't know that I can do what's necessary right now but I know you can, so I give myself to the ability you possess to be able to anoint me to handle what's in front of me with the anointing of the Holy Spirit and not in my own power. Amen. And this is what we have to do. We have to do that. Go to Hebrews chapter 7, and we're, we're going to read about this in Hebrews and Romans um, because I have it in my notes. How many of you know uh, there, there are a lot of people today that are choosing to be tumbleweeds? What they do is every wind that comes along can blow them anywhere they want them to go. How many of you have ever been around tumbleweeds where there are a lot of tumbleweeds? You know, the only way to stop them is for them to get stuck. They get stuck in a fence or they get stuck in a porch or they get stuck in a building. You know what I'm saying? And, and so God don't want us to be tumbleweeds. We're not called to be tumbleweeds just being blown around with everything that happens. He's called us to be trees, trees of righteousness which puts down roots. I, I, didn't go, I didn't go into this verse of Scripture. We're not going there, but I will use it in, uh, to put down roots so that even when storms come, we can stand the test of time. Listen, guys, when drought comes and we don't see anything happening, we don't give in to the conditions. We give in to where our root is planted. How many of you know the conditions under the dirt are totally different than the conditions on top of the dirt? So if you stay connected right, well, amen. Come on, y'all. If you stay connected right, then you grow right. You know, and, and you can continue to pull. Listen to this. In, in Hebrews chapter 7, starting in verse 24, it says, But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost. Everybody say that with me. Save to the uttermost. Those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for us. Here's the truth. Sometimes we lose sight of the fact that God is fighting for us. That Jesus is standing on our behalf. That Jesus purchased the victory and wants us to walk in that victory. Anyway, so this is what it says. He, he lives. He's, a, he's able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he lives to make intercession for them. Now, when I first got saved, how many of you know I, I didn't have an understanding of a lot of, of Scripture? I, had, I was kind of learning on the grow. I'm going to let that get you for a minute. 
I was growing, and I was learning as I was growing, because, you know, even if you take a, a seed and you plant it in the dirt, there's no evidence on top of the dirt that things are happening. But that seed has already started the process of maturing while it's buried under the dirt. You don't see the evidence of it. I, I heard one man say he, he decided to live this out in real life, so he said, I planted corn. And he said, I planted it, you know, in, in the yard beside my house. And he said, then, he said, I was waiting on the corn to grow. It didn't grow as fast as what I thought it should, so I dug up the seed, not realizing that the seed had already started because the seed knows what to do. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's in its DNA to grow. And it knows once it's buried... That condition is ripe for growth. Yeah. I mean, it's going it's to start. Now, you have to make the choice whether you're going to break dirt or not. Okay, so conditions on top of the soil may be totally different than conditions under the soil. This is why, you know, so I had to learn this. You know, when I first heard that, that Jesus not only died for me, but now he's making intercession for me, I didn't know how to handle that. I didn't know. I thought, you know, he, it's over, man. He's partying in heaven. That was my opinion then. He's defeated death, hell, and the grave, and now he's, he's, he's connected there. Everything's good. I, I didn't have an understanding of he ever lives to make intercession for me. And then when I started hearing that God sings over me, man, was that ever a religious mindset, mind-blowing thing? You know, when you start hearing stuff like that, that God that God cares enough that he pays attention to every area of our lives and that he don't want us to be, be out there just tumbling around trying to figure out how to make it, but he wants us to understand how to make it. All right, he wants to give us the understanding on how we can grow in the conditions that are necessary. I was listening to a guy um, not too long ago, and I don't have the whole story because I, I didn't plan on repeating it, but hey, here we go. He, he was saying, you know, redwoods grow fast. And the conditions where they grow are awesome. It's perfect for them. Well, somebody decided to take some redwoods and move to Iceland with them. And they planted them in Iceland. And they grew, I think he said, double as fast and taller than what they did in California because the soil in, Ca the soil in California is ripe for that to grow, for those trees to grow like they do. But the soil that was over in Iceland, I think it was Iceland is where they did it at, had volcanic you know, ash and all that stuff in it, and it was, it was more ripe for the trees to grow and produce better. So see, sometimes what we see in the natural may not look like it's that valuable. And what we see happening around us, it may consume us to the point to where it, it, it's, it's forcing us to quit. Are y'all with me? Yeah. But if we're rooted in God, then no matter what the conditions are, we have a different system feeding us. And it changes everything about us. It changes everything about my life. Come on, y'all. It changes everything about the outcome of situations in my life. So let's go to Romans 8 and verse 26. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8. And I'm going to be reading this out of the Amplified Classic. And my father-in-law is not listening. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 26, we're going to read through 30. It says, so too the Holy Spirit comes to our aid. How many of you thank God that he just comes to our Oh, my Lord, thank you, God, you come to my aid. Come on, y'all, the Holy Spirit, he, he comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness. So whenever you're at a point to where uh, an attack is happening or you feel like something's happening, just understand this. The Holy Spirit's there to lift you up so that you know you're not alone. He bears witness with us. He bear, and to bear witness with me means that he has to understand where I am. 
because he's, he bears witness with the conditions that I'm in, but he also tells me how to get out of those things. He gives me the instruction to live different. You know, I, I was talking with a pastor the other day, and um, he was telling me, you know, he's, he's really just um, right now just, you know, he, he just don't know what to do. And, and you know, he's got, he's got things happening and everything going on. And he made this comment to me, and this is the only reason why I share this story. He said, well, you know, but I can't force God to do anything. So if God don't want it done, it's not going to get done. And I, I called him on it because I said, now, wait a minute, let me ask you a question. So are you believing for this to happen? Because what, they, they got growth. How many of you know they, they, they need something new happening? And, and so I said, is this what you feel like is a part of your vision that God gave you for the church? Well, yeah. I said, well, then why are you questioning whether it's God's will or not? If you receive the vision, come on, y'all, and, and leadership sees that vision, catches that vision, then why would you be questioning whether it's God or not? How about apply faith? But, you know, I forget sometimes that everybody's not a faith person. So a lot, of, a lot of people are not taught faith. Well, this is what it is. When we're in that, in that weak place, we just don't use the Holy Spirit for a show. Come on, y'all, just, just to show people that we're holy by praying out in the Spirit, we, we don't use Him just for show. We let Him work in our lives in those situations. And, and it, when we do that, we, we have a relationship with him to the point to where we say, hey, you know, he recognized our weakness, and then he's able to lift us out of that, pull us up to where we begin to see things on a new level. And, I, and I've shared this story with you before, but how many of you know that's going to happen? Sorry, it just happens. Um, you know, Jim Caseman was looking at a building one time to be AFCM headquarters. Heard this years ago. You know, and he said he walked up, and I forget whether it was two or four stories. Anyway, he said, when I walked up beside the building, it was tall. You know, it was big. He said, from my view, it looked humongous, and the money was bigger than, you know, than what we had in the bank and all these things. You know, and he said, but I knew that that was the building that we were supposed to have. So he said, I, I just had to cast it over on the Lord. How many of you know sometimes you have to do that? Because seriously, a vision does not stretch you. It's not much of a vision, is it? I mean, seriously, if I can reach it with five dollars, and I got twenty, you got plenty. So vision is, you know. So he said, "I'm looking." Anyway, he said, "I had a witness from the Holy Spirit." How many of you know he bears witness with us? And uh, he said, "Then he said that time he was flying, he got in his plane, and he flew a twin. I forget what it was, twin engine plane of some kind." And he said he lifted off, and he said. Just so happened when he took off and, and he had to make a turn, and when he made the turn, he said, I could see that building that I was believing for down getting smaller and smaller and smaller. How many of you know? The higher you go up. The way you think the Holy Spirit lifts us up. Are you getting it? Come on, y'all. Why do you think he lifts us up? Because we've got to have God's perspective because we'll sink in ours. All right, and then when he took off, he saw that building. And, he, and I forget, he said it was just, just a small little thing. And he said, I looked down and said, oh, there, there's that building. And God said, now you see it how I see it. Come on, y'all. Sometimes, you know, the reason why the Holy Spirit lifts us up is to get us out of our own personal view. The reason why he lifts us up is to give us the God ideas yes. so we can see things from a different point of view. Yes. You think I'm going to get off this portion of Scripture today? Let's, let's go a little bit further with it. It says, this, this is what, when we don't know how to offer prayer or pray, excuse me, if we don't know what prayer to offer nor how to offer it, worthy as we ought, but the Holy Spirit, listen to this, goes to meet our supplication and pleads in our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. In other words, guys, there's a place where I can get with the Holy Spirit to where he knows the needs that I have, and we're able to pray it out in the Spirit in such a way to where we get a bigger view of it. You know, 
There, there's been things and situations in my life that I, I just did not know how to handle. I mean, I'll, I'll share one, you know, cause, and I know I've shared this one before, but we were buying property uh, to build a church in, in West Virginia, and when we went to buy the property, it just seemed like every time it would get ready to close, something would happen. Just something would happen. Just, I mean, it was just, it was like, the, the, you ever hear something was just throwing a monkey wrench into the whole thing? And it was always something stupid can i say it that way it was just silly stuff you know um everything was right the contract was right and uh so you know i went out on the property one day and i walked the property and was just praying you know of course i can pray in my own understanding but i started praying in the spirit and um all of a sudden i i heard about you know someone else on the property and they were out cursing the property. They'd got mad at me at the church and was going to the property because they knew that's where we were going to be building. So I walked out on the property, and I broke the curse that they had put on that property in the name of Jesus. I just broke it. I, broke, I got leadership to go out with me, and we just broke the whole thing. In two weeks, we had the property. Okay, now listen, guys. There's a reason why God lifts us up. It's to give us the understanding that we don't have naturally sometimes in those situations. This is why it pays to pray. Well, prayer is just not something that you do when you have to. Prayer is what you do even when you don't need to. It's communication with God. Now, let's go. So it's unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep to be uttered. Listen to verse 27. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what, the, what is the mind of the Holy Spirit and what his intent is. This is so important because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints according to and in harmony with God's will. So if you have something in your life and you don't know what's going on, pray it out in the Spirit and you can, you, you can get some insight into it and you'll, you'll know it a little bit better. Listen to verse 28. And we are assured and know that God, being a partner in their labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good to and for those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. Well, the important thing to remember here is we, we're able to know the will of God. Now, now, I know there's some things where, you know, you do need to pray and you do need to go you know what, God, do I step right now or do I not step? I understand all that. You know, there's sometimes, you know, there's some thing, things that I have went into. I got real southern then, things. <laughs> there's some things that, I, that I've went into to where I had to put prayer into it and I had to do, do the preparation time and I had to seek God, you know, to see exactly what, God, what are you trying to do here? You know, because I know the anointing. And I'm not, I don't say that boastfully. I, I know the anointing, and I know the anointing is present for any need that comes up. I know, I know you're able to work and do exceedingly abundantly above anything that I could ask, that we could ask or think, so I know that. But sometimes, you know, you've you got other things involved, and you just really need to, to step back and go, man, I just need the mind of Christ on this thing. I just need, I need God to speak clearly, you know, because it's easy to take a step of faith and then for noise to get involved. And this is the pastor I was talking about. This is one of the things that he did. They took a step of faith, and now there's noise. All right, so what do you do now? Do you let the noise drown, drown out the voice of faith? Or do you enlarge the voice of faith and drown out the noise? All right, so this is, this is what we, we have to do. All right, so in verse 28, we are assured and know that God is a partner in their labels. Everybody say this to me, God's a partner with me. How many of you know he's God, he's King of kings, Lord of lords? How many of you know Jehovah God Almighty? But he, choo he chooses to be our friend. All right, so, so he does work with us in these things. And, and it, it falls into design, and, and I know people use this verse of Scripture, you know, in a lot of different ways, and, and um, my father-in-law about once a year will come to me and ask me, how do you feel about that portion of Scripture? He's always checking me to see if I changed. I know what he's doing. I said, well, you know, I think you take it in context with what's going on 
with the rest of the verse and find out that praying in the Spirit is how you work everything and give God the ability to work everything out for your good. It's not that you disconnect from it and say, well, whatever happens is God. Because this verse of Scripture says, he's a co-laborer with you. I mean, so, so you, just, you just you pray it out and you get the mind of Christ on it. And then as you pray, God's able to change things and shift things and move things. And I said things again. And, uh, and do all this stuff. Listen to verse 29. For those who he foreknew, it says, from whom he was aware and loved beforehand, he also destined from the beginning, foreordained them to be molded into the image of his son and to share inwardly his likeness. That he might become the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he thus foreordained, listen to this, guys, he called. Come on, y'all, he also called. How many of you know you just, just, you're just not ordained to be a child of God? Come on. You're called. Now listen to this. And those who he called, he justified. So come on, y'all. I mean, you're justified. Jesus took it all on for you and justified you. Now listen, that means he acquitted you. He made you righteous. He put you in right standing with himself. So what we could not do, God chose to do for us. Isn't that awesome, guys? So what I could not, well, I couldn't do it in my own power. There was no way I could do it. So he did it for me, made a way for me. Now all I have to do is walk in what he's already set in place. And that makes it easier for me. You know, I, I had somebody talking to me about grace here a while back. And they told me, they said, well, what's, what do you think about grace? And I said, well, I think grace is awesome. Come on, y'all, don't you think grace is awesome? But I also know that God had to make it devil-proof and dummy-proof. Or we'd have found a way to mess it up. We'd find a way to do it. All right, so he also justified. Listen, if he justified you, he glorified you, raising you to heavenly dignity and, con and, a, and condition or state of being. So in other words, we're citizens of a different place. This is why I try. I, I went through this to start off with. I want to go back and grab it again. This is why the conditions on the surface can be turbulent. But you still produce. Because the conditions of the soil is totally different. Totally different where you draw your strength from. Changes everything when you say amen. Now let's go, if you will, to Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 5. I read a book years ago, and I don't even remember the name of it right now, but it was uh, about a, um, a pastor who was very judgmental, and he had, he had someone come into his congregation that had uh, tattoos on, and he knew they weren't living right, and instead of him operating in love with them, you know, he literally just judged them and condemned them. And, um, you know, and, I, and, and the book went this, this way. You know, he, it said it finally, um, God came to him one day and said, all right, since you're, you're so good at judging, what do you think should happen next in the world? And the pastor said, judgment, God, judgment. And um, nuclear bombs went off all over the world. And one of them went off close to him, and when he came to himself, he was melted in the highway of burning asphalt. And he questioned God about it. And God said, this is why I am the one in charge of judgment and not you. Because we see partially. <coughs> Come on, y'all, we see partially. So so let me let me show you this. It says... There is an evil, this is verse 5, listen to this, there is an evil that I have seen under the sun as an error proceeding from the ruler. So there is an evil that exists in the world. How many have believe, believed that there is an evil that exists in the world? I, I talk with people sometimes, they don't believe that evil even exists. And I tell them real quick, well, how can you even determine that? Well, they've allowed conditions to harden them so much to where anything is acceptable. This is why you can't let life situations 
destroy the compassion that you possess. It's easy to get hard. How many of you know there's somebody standing on every corner right now with a sign? To the point to where most people don't even want to have nothing to do with helping anybody. But that doesn't mean that just because there's somebody standing in the corner, on every corner with the sign, that you're not supposed to sense who you're supposed to help. This is, this is so important, guys, because, see, conditions and, and all the stuff going on in the world today is meant to desensitize you to being able to pray, to hear from God, to, to respond correctly. Come on, y'all. You know, you know I've, I've had more people here lately tell me, I just can't take it anymore. You know, there's a lot of people in that place to where they're, they're just at a point to where if one more thing happens, it's just going to all explode inside of them. So there is an evil that is under the sun. Can I get an amen on that? Come on, y'all. How many of you know there's evil everywhere? It, it just happens. I'll be honest with you, it goes all over the place. I mean, it really does. It's in godly households. It's in ungodly households. It's in religious organizations. It's in churches. I mean, there is an evil that's there, and, and, there's, and, and this is what it says. It's, it's under the sun. And there's also error proceeding from, from the ruler sometimes. So evil is everywhere, and if we're not careful, we can let it become the standard, which we see, and I wanted to show you this in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 2. You know, I always heard Cle Ecclesiastes um, proclaimed as, as a, a uh, how'd they say it? Uh, it, was a, it was a preacher who just was, had had enough. Preacher just just who had had enough, and he started looking at everything, and we can see this in Ecclesiastes one and verse two. This is what he says: "Vanity of vanity," says the preacher. "Vanity of vanities, all is vanity." How I many of you know if you go through your life like that, you're not going to have any peace. Can I tell you something else? You're not going to have any fun. Oh, let me go ahead and do it a little bit different. Are you ready? You're not going to have any joy. I mean, if you live your life where you think nothing is ever going to be good, then you ain't going to have nothing good. That's Southern for it's not going to be good. I, I'm just telling you, this is what it does. So this is what he says, vanity of vanity. Listen to this in, uh, in the Amplified Classic. We're going to read verses 2 and 3. It says, vapor of vapors. How many of you know, this is what he's trying to say. He said, everything's a vapor, man. You look at it one minute and it might be good, and, and you look the next minute and it's gone. I mean, you look at one thing, and it might look really good, and then all of a sudden, it just don't look that way anymore. Well, you've got to be able to handle the conditions of life. It says, futility of futility, says the preacher. Vapor of vapors and futility of futility. Isn't that just a wonderful attitude to have? <laughs> and then he says this. Listen to this, guys. All is vanity. Emptiness falsity, and vainglory. How many people do you know right now that are living their lives empty? Falsely. Come on, y'all. We could, we could probably, I mean, can we just put the rubber to the road? How many of you are living your life empty? Falsely. I mean, think about it, guys. How, how many times have we just reached the point to where um, we just feel like everything's just show? Verse 3 says, What profit does a man have left from all his toil of which he tolls under the sun? And then he makes this statement, Is life worth living? Do you see the slide? Do you see, do you see how things... This is why conditions are like they are right now, trying to get everybody motivated by sight instead of under the ground conditions by faith. You have to make the choice whether you're going to live by sight or walk by faith. And this is what ends up happening when you walk by faith. Are y'all getting anything out of this? When you walk by faith... You change, you, you tap into a different citizenship. Yes, we're in the world. Come on, y'all, but we're not of the world. 
In other words, we live different, don't we? We do things a little bit different. We act a little bit different. You know, uh, um, I better not do that one. But anyway, we, we do. We, we just had this. Now, now, if you will, go to Isaiah 59 and verse 19. Because there's some, I, I want to finish through verse 10 today of um, Ecclesiastes, um, and then we'll, we'll go somewhere a little bit different next week, I think. Isaiah 59, 19. It says, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. Now, I believe this comma is in the wrong place in this portion of Scripture. That's just me. All right, but this is the way it reads, and I'm going to read it how I think it should read. Is that okay? Y'all won't consider me blasphemous, right? You'll see the difference. It says, When the enemy comes in like a flood, comma, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Well, here's the thing. The enemy's already been dealt with for us. Come on, y'all. The enemy's already been dealt with for us. So I, I think the way this, this should read, will you allow me to do this? It says, when the enemy comes in, comma, are you ready? Like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. I believe that that, that fits more for a New Testament believer because the enemy's already defeated. All right, the standard's already been set. Don't go out of here and say, Pastor Rick's blasphemous. Read it like you want to read it. I'm just telling you how I read it. Okay, because I believe that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God leads us on how to raise a standard against him and stop him right in his tracks. And, and if you look at this, you know, the standard, I, I didn't do a lot of study on it because I wasn't planning on doing it, but Wayne will correct me if I'm wrong after church. Okay, it means a banner. Pretty much is what a standard is. In other words... When we raise up the standard, we lift up the banner saying, not allowed. Come on, y'all. Cannot enter. Don't even try. Does everybody follow me? All right, so this is what we do. When, when, we, when we do what we're supposed to do we're, we're, and we lift up that standard when the enemy comes in, we put a stop to him. This is why Jesus taught the church that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. All right, this is, what it, this is one of the things that he was talking about. Hell has no power over people. Can I, can I go ahead and go a little bit different with this? And, and I'll tell you something else. The voice of evil cannot accomplish anything without a listening ear. You have to bend the ear to hear. And that's your choice whether you do that or not. Listen, so when the enemy comes in like a flood, comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord lifts up a standard against him. So this is what we're supposed to do. Recognize the, the situation. Recognize what's going on in the world. Listen, guys, don't be motivated by fear. I, I can't tell you. I was listening to someone on a talk show the other day, and they were talking about the, the presidency and how it's going to, Fallen, you know, if it goes this way or if it goes that way. And y'all know what I'm talking about. If it, if it goes to the Democrats or goes to the Republicans. And uh, they didn't have no hope either way. <laughs> Isn't that something? I mean, they had no hope either. This is what they said. Uh, and I'm just being, if, Kam if Kamala gets in, I'm telling you right now, this world, this, this country's done. I, I, I. But if Trump gets in, I'm telling you right now, this country's done. And I'm thinking, where's the hope at all? Oh, y'all, this is why we're told, come on, that we're supposed to keep our eyes on God. God knows how to work these details out. It don't mean you sit home and do nothing. But anything you're motivated to do, you've got to be motivated to do by peace and not by fear. So be motivated by peace. Well, how do you stay at peace when total chaos is breaking out? There's only one way. You've got to be in the conditions of where you're planted instead of in the air. It's up to you to stay planted, right? You know, I, I believe this with all my heart, guys. There, there's been things in my life that I've had to deal with, and this is what I've, I've done. I, I just I, I go back to my roots. I go back to faith. Matter of fact, here coming up here 
I'm going to be taking you back to some faith roots, you know, teaching some basic principles of faith because it's easy for us to get where we're supposed to be and start operating. Um, I don't know whether I should do that. <laughs> we start operating where we're just drawing our ability and our power from all the vitamins floating around in the air and all the minerals floating around in the air. And the problem with that is, is you can stay, you can have conditions, green conditions for a while, but eventually what ends up happening is that those, con those conditions wear out. And now you're wondering why you struggle. You wonder why things are going on. Hmm. Everybody grunt with me. Hmm. Okay. So when the enemy comes in, recognize the enemy. Don't give ear to the enemy. Come on, y'all. Raise up a standard against him, against the enemy. Go, if you will, to verse 6. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 6. I still got 20 minutes. Not really. I'm, I'm, I do. But we're going to do communion. <coughs> Verse 6, folly is set in great dignity. While the rich sit in low place, lowly places, I have seen servants on horses. While princes walk on the ground like servants. And this is what he's saying in this portion of scripture. Everything to do with being in the kingdom of God is about serving. Did you know that? Everything to do is about serving. Um... I, I believe this. I don't care how anointed you are. Will you say amen to that? Amen. I don't care how anointed you are. If you lose your heart to be a servant, you are not going to be effective. It's just, it's just not going to happen. It's like that in, in all of your life. I mean, everything in my life is about serving people. Come on, y'all. It is. Everything in your life is about serving one another. It really is. I mean, this is, this is what we're supposed to do. So when he talks about this, he says, he says folly is set in great dignity because you can reach a point. I, I just got, I got to go somewhere right now, so y'all just bear with me. You can reach a point where you think you have so much wisdom and so much anointing and so much understanding that you, you, you know, nobody can even touch you. And you got to be really careful with that attitude. How I many of you know you can grow in God as far as you want to grow? You can get as big in God as you want to get, but if you ever lose the fact that there's unity and there's family, come on, y'all, and they're serving one another, man, it shifts you into something different. And, uh, and I've seen this happen in, in people's lives. We, we had a guy come in. I'm not going to mention his name when we were in, in Florence, and um, he nobody could touch him. He was an evangelist, but nobody could touch him. You know, he, he, hit, he hit out before service. He had to have a particular type of water, and I'm all for that. You know, bring your water with you. Don't expect me to go and buy you a $15 bottle of water. It ain't happening. But anyway, bring your, bring your water with you. You know, you do what you need to do. But when he came out, he, he just he had this attitude about him to where he had gained so much um, popularity. Can I say it that way? To where everybody had to meet his needs instead of... So um, we had a couple get up in the church and they had to leave. They had told us they had to leave. And as they were walking out of the church, you know, with, with some families and, you know, they put their finger up to let, let, let the preacher know they're being excused. So the, the one gentleman, I knew him, he put his finger up. And this is what this, this evangelist said. God forgive them for disrupting this service. How many of you know you can reach a point to where you can just you lose the humility? Okay? Because I knew these people's hearts. So folly is set in great dignity. While the rich sit in lowly places, I have seen servants on horses while princes walk on the ground. Leadership is about serving. Will you say amen to that? Amen. Now listen to what it says in verse 8. We're going to be here for a little bit because I, I want to get through 
the rest of this. It says, he who digs a pit will fall into it. Oh, that is so. We need t-shirts with that on it. He who digs a pit will fall into it. And whoever breaks through a wall will be bitten by a serpent. Now, isn't that something? He who digs a pit will fall into it. Um, this, is, this is one of the ways that I pray over you, not that you'll fall into your pit. Let me make sure I say that. But how many of you know the enemy does dig pits? And he loves to put holes in your path. And my prayer is, is that you won't fall into it. So here's the thing. If we live our lives in such a way to where sowing and reaping really catches up with us and we dig pits for other people to fall, the chances are you'll fall in your own pit. All right? But when you stay right, you listen to God. Everybody say it with me. I listen to God. I mean, every day then God exposes the pits. Amen. When I dig it, I'm doing it for a reason. All right? When the enemy does it, He's doing it for his reason. So therefore, I don't have to fall in his pit. Come on, y'all. I don't have to do it. But it's important for us to understand that if you, if you get your life to a point to where you're just totally just reactive and you're, you're vindictive and... Did I say that loud enough? Okay, and, and you do those things, then you're going to open up doors. And this is what it says. Then when you get to a wall... You can't recognize, and I'm going to talk about this for a little bit. Y'all going to hang with me, right? You can't recognize whether the wall is in place for you or to stop you. Because some walls were put in place to keep you out. Come on, y'all. Some walls are put in place to protect you. So when you stop, when you get to the point where you can't recognize the purpose of the wall and you break through a wall that was meant to protect you from snakes, how many of you know you get the other side of the wall? And, and this is what this is some of the things that we've been talking about in this portion of Scripture, about knowing the condition, staying connected uh, you know, to the condition of heaven. So then I recognize walls, because there's some walls, guys, I don't need to tear down. They were put in place for a reason. Are y'all? But there's some walls you need to tear down. I watched a show the other day where, um, you know, I, I like these um. These shows where people live off grid. Can I say this? I don't want to live off grid, but I like watching other people do it. And um, they went to this one area, and the house that they were gonna be in was flooded. And the guy started stomping on it, and it had ice in it. And he said, but the problem is, is he said, I don't understand how the house is flooded when the creek's way over there. It was a hot spring. It was way over there. So he got out, and he started looking around, and he found out that a beaver, a family of beavers, had built a beaver dam so they could create a lake so they could have an easy life. So this is what he said. It amazed me. He said, you know, I like beavers. <laughs> Michelle, you listening? Okay. <laughs> Chris, I made sure she was listening. I like beavers, but if I don't stop them, they're going to destroy the whole house because they have no understanding of you. No understanding of you at all. All they know is to build a dam. It's in them to build a dam. Come on, y'all. It's just part of their nature is to build a dam. I can't say what I want to say. They don't care. They don't give. Well, they don't care about the house. Does everybody follow me? I can't fit it in without it being wrong. Um, so they, they don't care about the house. So he had to make a decision. He said, even though I like beavers and I know they're in their habitat, we got a house and we can't move the house. So they tore down the beaver dam. But if they tore down the beaver dam, Michelle, close your ears for just a minute. 
the beavers just build it back, so they had to kill the beavers. Does everybody follow me? So a lot of times what we don't understand is there are people living in conditions where they don't understand spiritual things. I'm just using this as a, as a go-between. So the reason for the wall sometimes is to keep you safe. Well, you know, the reason for the anointing sometimes is to keep you safe. But if you don't know why the wall was built, if you're not in tune with the Spirit, is this making sense to y'all with the Spirit, to where you understand the purpose of the wall? Can you tear down one that's meant to protect you? Man, oh man, are you opening up yourself to some things. And this is, this is what this verse of Scripture reminds me of. Listen, you know, you can, you can dig a pit for someone else, but the, the thing of it is, is you'll end up falling to your own demise. And whoever breaks through a wall will be bitten by a serpent. But if that wall is keeping snakes out, how many of you know? Now, let me share a story with you here because I had a, I, I think I shared it out with some people. How many of you know in Florence we just had a guy who had um, five or six venomous snakes in his house? And one of them bit him. And um, I think there's been several people bitten by him. And um, I had a guy that worked for me. He, um, he loved snakes. He always wanted me to come to his apartment and look at his snakes. <laughs> now, how many of you know I'm not a snake guy? Do you understand? I know there's good snakes and there's bad snakes, and good snakes are the ones that are away from me. <laughs> and bad ones are the ones that are around me. I do recognize black snakes, corn snakes, you know, and stuff like that. But um, he, had, he had purchased, and it was illegal, a viper. Um, and, and he had it in an aquarium. And it was time for him to feed the viper. See, because if you, if you keep snakes, you're going to have to feed them. That's deep. That's deep. That's deep. Let that sink in. And then, um, so he went and he got, uh, I guess it was a rat or whatever, they, he fed this thing, mouse or whatever, and um, he opened the cage and he dropped the rat in the cage and he had a thought and he went to take care of his thought and when he came back to the cage, the viper was out. It had crawled out of the cage. Well, this is a very deadly snake. All right, so I asked him, I said, what would you do? He said, I opened the blind on the front window and stayed with my mom and dad. <laughs> he said, because food was in the cage, and I knew eventually the snake was going to get hungry. So he said, four I think three or four days it took him He'd keep going and looking in the window <laughs> until he saw the snake back in the aquarium. And he said, when I saw it back in the aquarium, then I went in and closed it, and he said, I made a note to never do that again. Now, see, this is where he and I differ. I would have never done it in the first place. All right, come on, y'all, because, because this, is, this is things that happen. Um, let's go into verse 10, because I, I, I want to finish this up. 10 and 11, then I'll be done. Nobody rejoice. Amen. Not out loud, anyway. I've, pour, I've read this portion of Scripture to you before, but I want you to pay attention to it a little bit different in context with what we've just been reading over the last few weeks. All right, and this is what it says. If the axe is dull... And what does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. But wisdom brings success. This is what this is saying. If your axe is dull and you lose the edge, you'll have to work harder. Isn't that something, guys? How many of you have ever chopped wood? How many of you have never chopped wood? We're going to have a wood chopping thing here before too long so you can at least experience it. I mean, this is the thing. You know, I, my dad used to volunteer since there was, there was four boys. He would volunteer us so he could make money for cleaning up land. Everybody got that? That's why you had kids like that. 
Yeah. And, um, and so we go out. But uh, he knew better than to give us a sharp axe. So what he would do is he'd give us a dull axe. And he would take the sharp axe. And he could hit something one time and it would work. We'd have to hit it four times for it to work. Okay, but he knew that we weren't skilled with the axe. All right, eventually, I learned how to sharpen my own axe. This is the thing, guys. You're responsible for having your edge right. And there are times when life is going to dull you. All right? That doesn't mean that the axe is bad and you throw it away. That means you got to know how to haunt it. you got to sharpen it. And there's a right way to put an edge on something and a wrong way. Can I get an amen on that? All right? My dad always used a file. I mean, you know, it's not the best way because you lose a lot of the, a lot of the iron. But it talks about this. There's preparation, and there's, you got to recognize conditions sometimes. It's easy to recognize the dullness of an ax. It's easy to recognize when your prayer life gets weak. Come on, y'all. It's easy for you to recognize whenever you're not reading the Bible like you should because your life gets dull. And it's like you're trying to cut steak. Let me do it different. It's almost dinner time or lunch time, right? It's like you're trying to cut cheap steak with a butter knife. You'll get it eventually, tore all to pieces, barely able to chew it. A lot of it's got to do with the steak. We won't go there right now. But anyway, you, you're responsible for knowing where your life is. And just me telling you that doesn't mean that I don't care about you. It just means I do because here's the thing. I get an hour a week with some of you, some of you two hours a week. But you're at home the rest of that time or at work. And you're responsible for sharpening your axe. Come on, y'all, for keeping your life right, for keeping your life going the right way. you got to be the one to do that. How many of you know uh, the Word of God and people help you do that? Will you say amen? amen? Let's go to verse 11, and I'll close with this. I already shared my story on this, but... um. I tell you what, I'm going to read verse 11 and then I'm, I'm just going to read Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19. It says, a serpent may bite when it is not charmed. Can I go back and pick up on the snake story? Here's the thing. Whenever you start playing with snakes, you have to learn how to handle snakes. And if you don't handle them right, I, I, I laughed one time because, um, who was it? The snake guy, the guy that used to do, he, he, um, he died. Australia. Yeah, in Australia, you know. Yeah, Steve Irwin, you know, he, he was on a, I think, Johnny Carson one night, and somebody somebody asked him, said, well, does that snake bite? And he says, oh, no, this snake don't bite, and it bit him. And he said, well, normally. Here's the thing with playing with snakes, y'all. Snake has the attitude of a snake. It has the DNA of a snake. And th this is what it says. You can learn how to charm the enemy. Come on, guys, you can learn how to. But it doesn't mean you're not going to get bit. And it says, it, it relates it this way, the serpent may bite when it is not charmed, and the babbler is no different. Now let's read Ephesians chapter 2, and I'll close. We're going to start in verse 19 through 22. I am going to go into this next week. I do need to say this to you. You can't charm the enemy. You've got to rebuke him. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. Say that with me. I'm no longer a stranger or a foreigner, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief, chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Will you say amen to that? Here we are, guys. We're no longer strangers.
We're no longer foreigners, but we're fellow citizens. Will you say amen to that? Would you do this for me? Would you stand to your feet and let me pray over you? And we're getting ready to receive communion. So give me just a, give us just a minute to get things set up. I do want to do this. Um, every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around right now. If you're here and you've never accepted Jesus into your heart, or maybe right now you're out of fellowship with God, maybe it's one of those things to where, you know, you, you just allowed some of the conditions of the atmosphere to grab a hold of you. Um, the Bible says that in Romans 10, 9, and 10, if you believe with your heart, and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. Will you say amen to that? With the heart you believe unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So it's easy to do. It's a simple thing. God's already paid the price. But it brings such change in your life. If you're on Facebook and you've never prayed this prayer before, we'll post the prayer at the end of the service. Anybody here would slip your hand up and say, that's me, Pastor. I want to make sure... If you're out of fellowship with God right now, guys, it's just a matter of turning back to God. Will you say amen to that? I mean, this, this is it. That's, that's what it is. How many of you know, we, we got, all of us have things in our lives that try their best to take us away from God. Try to get us to turn away from God. You don't have to do that. No hands. All right, let me pray over you. Father, right now, I pray over each person here that this word will take root in them and grow. It will accomplish everything that you please. It will prosper in these vessels that it's been sent into. And I thank you, God, that as we honor your word and we put you first in our lives, God, that you pour yourself into us. You give us insight and you give us wisdom. You help us see some of the traps and, and the things in our way. And God, I thank you that your Holy Spirit leads, guides, and directs us. In Jesus' name, and would you say amen if you agree. Let me ask the ushers, if they will, to come forward. Um, we're going to do communion pretty much the same way that we do it. We're going to let you come forward and receive it.